Hey guys, welcome to another OJ Health Radio. I'm here with Matt Sykes. We're actually locally in Norwich. And Matt, thanks for joining me. Thanks for getting me involved, Ollie. Really looking forward to the next uh, half an hour, 45 minutes. Yeah, my pleasure. And as I've said to you that, and to you guys as well, that it's OJ Health Radio, but we're bringing topics in from all different aspects and all different areas. Over the last few years, I've built up a lot of contact, uh, contacts even. And Matt is an expert in sales. Um, that's, that's the idea. Yeah, so... We're all selling something, aren't we, mate, at the end of the day? So. Exactly, exactly. So, Matt, thanks for joining me. No um, first off, just tell the guys a little bit about who you are yep. and uh, why you're the man for sales. Okay, sell so... Yourself. Yeah, okay, I'll sell myself. What a, there you go, sell me this pen. Um, <laughs> so, 52 years old, even though I look about three. Uh, most of my corporate life has been spent... In, in the sales world, Ollie. Yep. So I, I got my first proper sales job in 1998. Um, I went right the way through the whole sales rep, sales manager, sales director thing, got to 2014 and sort of mid forties and thought to myself, mm, this is great, but what happens next? I've got another 20 years to go. Do I still want to keep doing this thing? And like most people, I think in life, you have that what happens if moment. Um, and rather than just saying, well, never mind, carry on as normal. I thought, well, what happens if? What's the worst that could happen? So I, st I stepped off uh, from the corporate sales role where I was an employee and I started working for myself in 2014. And I didn't quite have the cojones really to start my own business. Mm -hmm. So I bought a franchise. I, I, I wanted to go into the training industry, which is what I do for a living now. I teach people how to sell. Um, but at that time in 2014, the training franchise model I bought was in personal development. Um, and I spent a couple of years working in that business. It was a, a fledgling franchise business. I knew the guy who owned it really, really well. In fact, he was a trainer of mine and when I first met him. Um, and we worked together to help him grow his business up to about seven or eight franchi franchisees at the time when I decided to move on. And I decided to move on for two reasons. First of all, trying to sell mindset and attitude training to people is incredibly difficult. And we might touch on that yep. in a little while. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't say I copped out, but I just thought to myself, there's got to be an easier way of growing a business. And the second reason why I moved out was because my skill set was selling and everything I've known was, was the world of sales, some good bits and some bad bits. I thought, well, why don't I stay in the lane? Why don't I bring some of this mindset and attitude work that we deliver to, to everybody in, in this, this franchise business? Why don't I niche down and say, right, let me go and help salespeople. Uh, they all need a little bit of this. Um, they also need the sales skills that go with it. If I can combine those two things together, that would be quite a nice business. So 2016, 2017, I created the company that I run now, which is called Sales Cadence. And ultimately, as you described, what I do is I help people sell stuff. And when you say you niche down into the sales, is there a specific industry you target with the sales or is it just sales in general? No, I have this mantra. Uh, I have a podcast as well, Ollie, and, and, and the mantra on that show is everybody's in sales, we're all selling something. Mm -hmm. and, and if you think about that, it's very, very difficult to disagree with that statement because if I'm a school kid, I'm selling my parents on not doing my homework, right? If I'm a parent, I'm selling my, my boss, I'm getting a pay rise. If I'm the boss, I'm selling my employees on the vision, mission, values of the organization and my success to translate that, influence them, is going to have a big impact on their ability to want to come on the journey and make a successful business for myself. And, you know... I don't think there's anybody out there that wants to be a salesperson because if we ask people what they what words come to mind if you just said describe a salesperson they'd, they'd get the usual ones like sleazy, pushy, arrogant actually it's the opposite to that there are some people like that out there like there are bad accountants or you know poor bookkeepers mm -hmm. or people that don't know how to do I don't know HR um, there's, there's bad apples in every industry as there is in the sales industry but what I found is, if you flip it on its head and you said to yourself, okay, if I really want to help, if I'm really passionate about what I do, like you are about what you do in your business, mate, if I'm really passionate about that and I know that what I do helps people improve their life, why on earth wouldn't I want to go out there, stand on a soapbox and start telling the world about it? The only thing that I need to do is be mindful of how I get that message out there. And I think, I think when, you're, when you accept the fact it's less about selling, it's more about helping, and life starts to get a lot easier from a sales perspective. Yeah, I suppose there's always a lot of people. I mean, I come from the sales background in insurance, yeah. um, working in there in call centers before and doing management, but a lot of people get a lot hung up on sales. If something you're passionate and then you know someone needs, then it should be easy to tell them that they need it. But people 
probably get the more, wrong mindset when it comes to sales. They do, and again... And worried about selling as well. They, th there's a number of things going on there, you're absolutely right. The first thing is that, and we talked before we started hitting record about stereotypes, there's, there's that stereotypical image of the, the shiny suit second-hand sales guy, and we can't seem to get that out of our head. Um, there's also the other thing, which is, I'm not very good at it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not very good at lots of stuff, okay? And that has an impact on my confidence. And if I'm not confident about something, I've got two choices. I can either ditch it and not do it, or I can change that mindset, become more confident by learning the skills, practicing the skills, and getting good at the skills that removes that lack of confidence. So I think people have the wrong impression of what salespeople do. I think they are fearful of the, of the fact they can't do it. Yep. And then, of course, the third thing is, is whether or not they can find the right people to go and help. Because too many people in my experience, and we see it a lot on social media, mate, think everybody wants to buy what you've got. And, it, and that isn't the case. Less than 10% really want what you've got, and probably only 3% of that 10% want to buy it now. I the other some 7 people don't is, know either. That's right. The other 90% mate, don't want it. I've got no thoughts about it. Why bother? But of course, too many people are trying to ram this, this message down people's throats. So it's a very interesting uh, topic, but when we get to a situation where we accept the fact there's only a certain number of people that are right for us, Mm -hmm. that fit our, we, we call it an ideal customer profile, when we know who they are and we start to engage with them on their terms, then all of a sudden things start to work and we start these conversations and if you follow a sort of step-by-step -step process, most people will buy from you. So how have you managed to get your magic source as such when you, you said about the difficulty to sell sales, how have you managed to get over that with people? Um, it's, it's a great question. How do you get over it? So my job as a sales trainer is to help people see. We don't, we don't sell anything really. I think the important thing, what, we, what you and I do, you do especially, is we sell outcomes. Mm -hmm. right? Nobody wants to come on a sales training session with Matt. What they want is their sales to go up yep. or their conversion time to reduce or their deal, time, their deal rate to increase. But, but of course, they have to go through the pain and hardship of going through that training. Um, it's like you in your organisation, the, the world that you immerse yourself in. Very few people want to hit the hard yards and get on the treadmill and do the exercise and have the right foods and do that day after day after day after day. No one wants to do that, really. Okay, some, some people enjoy that, but most people struggle with that. But what they want, of course, is to look fantastic, to, oh, be, yeah. to be great in bed. Yeah, yeah? Exactly. To feel fantastic when they walk down the high street. Yeah? Yeah. But of course, it's, it's how you translate that message. So in answer to your question, how do you make that switch? You show people the promised land at the start. And it's almost like uh, the word I sometimes use is full disclosure. You say, look, I've got no idea if I can help you, right? But let's pretend I could. You know, if you looked into the future in 12 months time, you know, what would need to be going on in your world, in your fitness, in your love life, in your business, that would suggest that doing something right now would have been the right idea? And when you help people see that, you've got half a chance then of saying, right, in order to get there, we've got to do a little bit of work together. Okay. And like going into the psychology, I suppose, one of the things that I found hardest, I think going into my niche of working with entrepreneurs, working with business owners in health was going from low end to high end sales and the self worth that came along with people, especially around here, not charging what I charge locally. But as we said beforehand, most of my clients are well, a couple in Norwich, but most of them are further afield and even US, Australia, places like that. So how do you get over that psychology of self-worth as such? Um, the, the first thing I always say to myself, it, it's exactly the same amount of work if I'm selling something for £100 or £100,000. Mm -hmm. The process is identical. The amount of work I'm going to put in is probably going to be the same. The journey we're going to go on together is going to be pretty much the same journey. So I think the value thing to some extent we can solve quite, quick, quite quickly. The shift from low value to high value, it all comes back to two things, Ollie. Um, if there's not a problem, there's never gonna be a sale because people only buy two things. They buy a solution to a problem or they buy an improvement to something that already exists. Everything else, forget it. Yeah. So, so there has to be a problem or a need to start with. Um, that's how we start the conversation going. And then the second thing is, if we've identified the fact that they've got a problem that needs solving and they're interested in having a conversation about how potentially we could help them solve it, we then have to quickly get them to a position where they see a return on their investment. Because if you, if, if you think about it in my world especially, and also in yours, 
if I can show them that if they want to invest £10 in me, they'll get £100 back, they'll probably go for that. Yeah. And where we get it wrong, in, 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 in my world of selling, and, and you know, if I think about your world about health and lifestyle, is people fail to see the return on investment. Most deals don't happen, or they stall, or they die, because the business case isn't big enough. Or maybe shiny objects that come in, in the way as well, promising quicker in, as well. Distractions can come in, yeah. of course. But, but you know, if I think specifically about my world that I work in where I help sales teams you know, sell more stuff, coronavirus comes along and everybody's pipeline stops, right? And some of those have fallen out and dropped off and never see them again, and that's fine. But there'll be some stuck in there right now. Even today, we're in the middle of July, and we start to come out of this pandemic. There'll be organisations that might listen to this and think, I have got some deals in my pipeline that are stalled. They're stalled for two reasons. The first reason is that first one I just said, which is there was never a big enough business case in the first place. Because mm -hmm. if there was, they'd have done it by now. Yep. And then the second problem is, and this is the one that most people miss, is there's more than one person in every deal. If I think about your world, let's say you're helping a 45-year-old CEO you know, get fitter, be better in bed, um, to feel better when they walk down the street in a suit that actually fits them rather than yeah. one that looks That's like That's one it. of the biggest ones, the suits. Yeah, yeah. If, if you think about that, then, then the challenge has got to be, how do I help them see that there's a benefit for going through the hard work and pain to get me there? And if I can show them that return on investment, they'll probably do it. And how do you do that? Uh, you've, got to, you've got to shine that light. I mean, in my world, it'd be interesting to know how you do it in your yeah. world. In my world, very, very simple. My ideal customer profile is a sales director or a CEO. Yep. Uh, they will have overall responsibility for the sales function of that business, right? They are the decision maker, but there'll be people around them, of course, that, that also makes that decision. Um, that point I was gonna to say to you as well, so think about that CEO you're talking about in your world, he's probably got a partner, a wife, or yeah. a, another half. That's one of the, like going to see those clients. If oh. he or she can't convince their other half, they're always going to be struggling, and you'll know more about this than mm -hmm. me, but, but it's never just the one person, there's always someone in there. So, so, so how do we do it? Um, the principle is pretty straightforward, really. Um, we, we have to let them see at the start that there's that return on investment. So I'm sitting down with a sales director, and the very first thing I'll say to them, once we've established there's a problem, there's a need, let's talk about your sales team. How many people in your sales team? And you know, let's say we get a hypothetical number of 10. Make the maths easy. Okay, of those 10, how many would you class as A performers? How many would be the B average? And how many C are pretty useless? And then they'll give me that ratio. And then, and then the first thing that I'll start to ask them is, is, do you want to spend any money on the Cs? Or do you want to just move them on or coach them out? Because quite often you'll find that even if you tried your hardest, you'll never change the mindset of those C class people. They just are who they are, and therefore throwing money at them, trying to improve them, probably is a waste of money. So the first thing we'll start to do is that. We'll analyze. What are, the, what are the tangible disadvantages of keeping those C people in their team, right? We'll look at the B people and say, what we've got to take to get to A's? Well, we've got to do this, they've got to do that and the other. Okay, let's just pretend we could do that then, or at least improve them by 15%. What does that 15% get you? And the way that you work that calculation out, Ollie, is pretty simple. How much is the team collectively earning at the moment? How much are they missing target by? If we increase by 10 or 15%, what is the financial implication, the upside, of that and sometimes you can get that number to a million two million three million and then of course when you're talking about a return on investment that could be millions you can start to see how they would always struggle and have a problem with your price mm -hmm. because my training as good as it is doesn't cost a million pounds yes yeah. same as your solution right but if we can't make that 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 conversion and they have to work that out themselves and be interested to see how you do it in your world but I get them to get the piece of paper and the pen and the calculator out because if we can't make that problem that they've got real and tangible and painful enough, guess what's not gonna happen? You can't do anything about it. So interesting, in your situation, if you think about that CEO who's 45 years old, how do you, how do you show them that return yeah. on investment? I think uh, when, when I look at a couple of examples I've done is that working with twins, one in Budapest, one in Philadelphia, one in finance, one military vet in it, veteran in, in business coaching, um, if anyone follows me, they'll know exactly who they are, and I've spoken about it before, is that uh, we were at uh, the Baby Barfoot event last, last year, and I was with um, one who's a client then, great friend as well, and his nephew, so the guy in Philadelphia's son, saw a picture of him, and he just went, Dad, Dad, why can't you look, look like Uncle Stephen? An hour later, he was signed up, and I've been over there a couple of times, I think it was like 40, 50 pounds he dropped in the first five months, struggled a bit during lockdown, as I think a lot of people have, 
but in a much better place. And I think that was the emotion of having a family member tell you that. Having your son tell you, why can't you look like your twin brother? They're identical twins as well. That's going to be powerful. Uh, and also when people have come to me and said they don't have time to work out. Now, working out training part is probably only 10%, mm. maybe 15% of what I do. Like diving into the deeper health, as we say about mindset as well, getting productivity up, for, uh, being able to focus more, uh, less brain fog and just having more energy. But just talking about well, why can't you get 15 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day? Everyone can get that and just starting at that and getting into a habit of doing a little bit. So what, you, what you've touched on there is a brilliant point. So there's a, there's a, a pretty well-time-served phrase which, you, which we'll, we'll know, the, the viewers, listeners will know as well, which is people buy emotionally and then they justify logically after, mm-hmm. right? And you hear that everywhere. And it's really, really true. It's really, really important from a sales perspective. And what you touched on there is a really important example of that, where um, kid shows his dad. Is that was that the case? Yeah. Yep. Sh- shows him a picture of, of the twin. So emotionally, that guy is now sold because his son has said to him, "Dad, why can't you be like that?" Mm-hmm. And he's seen that picture, and he's asking himself emotionally, "Shit, why can't I be like that?" And my son wants me to know. So emotionally, exactly. now he's there, right? Yep. He's sold. But of course, people won't buy anything until they've justified it thereafter. And, and this is where you come in. And you know the, the, the big part that I do in my business is, is accountability. Because the logical justification then is, okay, how does Matt or Ollie show me, justify to me logically how I can get there? What are the steps? What have I got to do? How often I've got to do it? And if I can, if I can see that and I can map it out, and actually I can justify that, it's not a huge amount of time and effort but the payback is immense. Mm -hmm. You then bridge that. People buy emotionally, they justify logically. There's a third element to that where they've got to get to know him. Just turn into a training session. Well, it is a little bit (laughs) like that. I wish I could take the credit for this. I can't. It's a guy called Nick Rickson who was training me during during lockdown. But you've got to go from emotion to logic and then translate that into knowing that what you're about to buy makes sense. And and that example you gave there just sort of nailed it really. Yeah, it's massively powerful when I see that. And he earns like, well, he actually earns 50 times what I'm charging him per month. And you think, you're earning a hell of a lot. I should charge you a bit more when we talk about the accountability side of things. And it still took a while to get him to do it. Yeah. Like, so it still there was an emotional block. And That's interesting as well. And you're touching on that point. So one of, the, one of the big objections that we'll hear, irrespective of what you're selling, is it's too expensive. right? And, and that is a classic example of me or you or somebody else not showing that person who says it's too expensive enough value in the start of a conversation. That's where questions come in and reassurance and and all of that kind of stuff, accountability, uh, credibility. People will always object to your price if they don't see a value exchange. Um, But the too expensive thing, actually, when you really start to work it out, if if his investment in you is just one fiftieth of what he earns, and the payback is 50 times more, Mm -hmm. it's a flipping no brainer. Exactly. It is a no-brainer. But I'll tell you what I used to be scared of saying, that I'm not now. What happens if you don't? If you've put on 50 pounds in the last year, and what happens in two years' time? Can your body take another 100 pounds? And I use the power of what happened with my dad, and that wasn't because of overweight, that was because of stress that he passed away. And uh, are you going to actually see your son get to 18? And that is a kick in the balls for a lot of people. Uh, But I, I will say the thing that has been a struggle and it wouldn't be if the partner was on the phone is the partner when we talk about health side of things and one of the things that i've seen with that is that it seems more with females mm. and this is blank in a, a bit as well i'm working with more females than our males at the moment okay. which is interesting like the, the flip side yeah which is really cool um, being able to do that but how they'll get on the call be super engaged know the power of it and then they'll go and say their husbands it's their own money and then the husband will say just sign up to a local personal trainer which they've tried before, hasn't worked, and they don't need the training. And it's getting over that. It's, it's been the other way around, like, oh, the wife doesn't want me to do that. Because they've done it like, in the husband's like, they've done it before, they've failed before, what's gonna be different this time? Yeah. And I don't know whether you've come across that specifically yeah, yeah. in it's, the sales side. It's, it's a classic objection. But here's the thing, if that happens quite frequently, then the great news is we know it'll happen again. Yep. And if we know it's gonna happen again, guess what we can do, we can prepare for it. 
And you know, if I go back to the point I made a little while ago, which is there's more than one person involved in the decision-making process. Ollie, you might be the chief problem officer. You might be the person that your organization has put in front of me to buy sales training from. But I know there's probably four or five people around you who are gonna sign off the deal. If I can't, and if we use that as the example, if we use the example you said, mate, which is, which is the other half or, or, the, or the husband. Yeah, it's or the purely because of the health side rather than business. If we aren't able to bring that other half into the conversation soon enough, then we run the risk of A, them saying, I'll just go to a local trainer, or B, we then rely on the girl to do your job for you. And it's not the same conversation. And no one can all. do your job for you, mate. No. You've got years and years and years of fitness and health experience. How on earth can anybody do what you do better than you? Exactly. So what we have to do in that situation is at some point when we're having the early conversation with a potential client, back to full disclosure, we have to say, look, here's what typically happens when we get to this point in the conversation. You get really excited. You can totally see the payback. You want to go ahead. But of course, you go back to your other half. And this happens a lot. And they always say, oh, why don't you just go down the road? So, so what are you going to say to him when he says that to you? And I always push that across the table and say, you tell me what you're going to say. And if the, the, if the response I get back doesn't give me enough confidence that that person can do it, then we have to have a second conversation, which is, okay, so what else have I got to do to help you help him see that what you're about to do makes sense? Mm. And if I can't help that person, then I'm probably sure that the thing's going to die. Why don't we get him involved? Just get him on a call. And I'll take him through some of the things that we're going to do together and he can see the up. Because if our friend over there realizes that, you know, they're going to have a much stronger relationship as a result of her, you know, endorphin levels yeah. going off the chart. Cause More she works sex drive you. and everything, yeah. He's all of a sudden getting some return on investment. So exactly. it's not difficult when you think about it, but we, we, we fail to see we, the whole sales thing, Ollie. We, we make it too complicated and it doesn't need to be. It's basic, it's basic fundamental human psychology. And getting personal as well. Not being afraid to be getting personal, I suppose. And, and pretending, again, back to the stereotypical, people have cocked it up for us in the past by you know, trying to use nine, sophisticated 1985's closing techniques, which are bullshit. You know, at the end of the day, if you're civil and courteous to people, if they've got a problem and you ask them, do you want some help? And they say yes, and you go, would you like that help to be me? There's your close. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be difficult, but we try that relationship. I suppose the jab, 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 right hook. The, the Gary, Gary Vee thing. Yeah. <laughs> Had to bring him in. Um, As a bit more marketing than selling, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, so just building that, that bank of trust beforehand. And I suppose that's yeah. that's been my frustration through lockdown, as I said to you, of not having access to the gym, not stressing myself out of pushing myself to do something I don't like doing, mm. of full workouts at home. And I've like, held my hands up and said that. I've got like three or four clients that have said, oh, I don't want to go back to the gym. That's yeah. cool. I like the gym for the full experience. Uh, that actually having the the drive, the motivation to put that content out. And I've just focused on my existing clients more and just making sure I'm there for them as, as they need. Have, have you had to adjust your business through lockdown? Yes. Uh, yes and no. So before I answer that question, don't let me forget it. People are gonna change, right? When you have something as, as, as disruptive as coronavirus, then the problem that your clients or prospects had before March 2020 has probably changed. So even though they look like a client, they might have bought from you in the past, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that their world is different now than it was then. Perfect example, someone who frequently went to the gym has suddenly discovered the last four months they can train themselves, they've got themselves in great shape, what do I need to spend you know, 50 bucks a month for? So, so people, people have changed. And sort of a, a lesson I ask all my clients to consider is just go back to check and just make sure that the problem that you used to solve still exists because you might have to tweak your products in order to get there. Um, in answer to your question, yeah, I mean, week, week one, I'll be honest with you, my, my diary emptied. You know, I deliver face-to-face -face training. Just instant. In a heartbeat, people said, whoa, we obviously can't get in a room anymore. Let's cancel those bookings that we've made for June and July. I had a really large conference that I was speaking at in May. About 750 people were going to be there. I was one of the speakers. And I, the strategy that I built up, I knew about this from October of last year. So literally from January, I'm putting a strategy in place off the back of that conference, setting up some training, uh, other bits and pieces, because I'm pretty sure of those 750, I can probably get seven or eight as clients. Yep. That all goes out the window. So first week, I'm sort of thinking to myself, well, what do I do? And, I'm, and all I did, Ollie, for the first week was watch. 
I looked to see what my competition were doing, I looked to see what my clients were up to, and then I thought, okay, I've got to work this problem. So week two, pick up the phone, start ringing around, talking to clients, what are you doing, what's happening, what are your thoughts, what do you think should happen? Week three, I rang up um, some really large t training providers. Week four, I jumped on a Daniel Priestley webinar and asked him the question, what are you going to do? You're one of the largest providers of personal development training around. Are we all going online? In not in a million years. Some of, when we come out of this, some of our training will shift to online because we mm -hmm. find that quite easy and our clients appear to quite like that. But there is no uh, replacement or substitute for getting people together. Baby in the Bath was a perfect example. Any conference, it's not just the speakers you listen to, it's the connections that you make in the room. You cannot make connections on a Zoom call. Yeah, I was having this discussion with, with someone yesterday about it. Waste of time. Yeah. And if anyone's going to try and get me on a networking Zoom call, that ain't happening because I cannot make those conversations with people, those other 25, 30 people. So what did I do? I, I said, right, I need to make myself available to my clients first and foremost. I set up a separate business, mattsykes.biz, one-to-one -one Zoom coaching, three different offers, basic premium pro, the usual thing. Um, first call on me, and if you want to get involved with some coaching, here's some costs for you. And made it really affordable. And, and the point I did that for, Ollie, was to, to in, one of the benefits I found from coming out of coronavirus was improving the user experience. And one thing that will change and has changed and must continue to be important is how easy it is now for us to jump on a Zoom call. Okay, how can I take that how easy it is and bring that into the rest of my business? Mm -hmm. You know, because in the past it might have been quite difficult for people to, like, great example, I now auto sign all my booking forms and client contracts. They don't have to download it anymore and sign it and then scan it and Do send it online. Back. Yeah. yeah, I would never have done that if it weren't for coronavirus. And that's such a simple thing. So, so set a little thing up to get me going and start having lots of conversations, giving away loads of free advice as you do because you panic and you think, Christ, am mm -hmm. I going to be in business? Changed my mindset and thought, if it's free for 30 minutes, I'm sharpening the saw. I'm keeping myself sharp. So I'll actually get something out of it as well. And who knows, some of these conversations might lead somewhere. Some of them did. The second thing that I did was I sat down and, and finished the book, the second book. And the third thing I did, I looked at my product range and thought, right, has the problem shifted? No, how do I know? Because I've asked clients, right, do my products still fit? Some do, some need to change, some need to get rid of. So I sort of came out of it really with a, a much better business model that would not have been the case if it hadn't been for COVID. So it's turned into a positive? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, 100% positive. I think a lot of people don't switch things when they could, like the perception. It took a while for me to switch that into perception, but now I've got two new business ideas coming from alongside health coaching. That is a mindset. They wouldn't have happened if that didn't happen. But you know what, mate? That's a mindset thing, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, you know we're all different. You and I are of the same cloth. We will search for the, the solution in every situation. It might take us a couple of weeks. We might yep. beat ourselves up a bit. But there will come a point in time, because our psychology is that way, because you've trained it that way, you'll yep. think, right, how do I get out of this mess? What's the lesson I can learn? How do I improve? You know, I watch you on Instagram, I see the music that you make now, and I think, jeepers creepers, this guy's got talent. He, he's Appreciate got, it. No, but I yeah. genuinely, I wouldn't say it, but in a minute, I yeah. genuinely think myself, I couldn't do what you do. And there's screens going on, all sorts of mixing stuff happening, some great sounds coming out of it. And he's also got a business over here, which is successful, and he's running an, on, running an online business, mate. That takes serious hard work. Mm -hmm. But you can't just flick a switch and get people to purchase stuff online. Yeah. You have to earn the right, right? So... But, but what you do and what I do it is a mindset thing, which is, I can't change this. I can't control the uncontrollables, but I can control myself. What can I do differently? How do I find a way out? And, and I think that is something which only a certain percentage of the population have got, because there'll be plenty of people, and I'm not saying it's wrong, will be looking at coronavirus and going, oh, woe is me. Yeah. You know, this is, I'm just doing that. Where's, where's the next paycheck coming from? And what they tend, what they kind of do, mate, is they, they sort of get their remote control and they hand it to Boris Johnson or Donald Trump and they say, go on, press those buttons. You make me feel how you want me to feel. And the reality is that, that they, they can't do that. That privilege of how you feel and how you behave is down to you, but it's a skill. I suppose, it, and it's not to say that there's nothing wrong when people get that mindset. I think I had that mindset for the first week or two. I remember the Sunday after gyms closed, I was sitting on my sofa on the Sunday morning and just literally lost thinking what the fuck am I going to do and like I've cried during lockdown multiple times because I left the corporate world to have control control was taken from me well I can only walk my dog once a day we, we had it like 
comment on that as well. Like, tell my dog you can only have a one walk a day. And like, all that sort of thing. And I think that's where taking responsibility comes from. This is going off on a bit of a tangent is that every single thing that happens in our life is because of us and having responsibility for that. Relationship works or relationship doesn't. Business work, business doesn't. And rather than passing the buck, passing the blame onto someone else is that, and we've had that and we've seen it multiple times with before lockdown, but especially in lockdown of people, oh, it's not my fault this has failed. It's not my fault I've put on loads of weight and everything like that and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's crazy. It is crazy. And it's an absolute, un, totally, un, I agree with you 100%, absolutely understandable why people think like that. Mm -hmm. We have, all of us got this inbuilt negativity bias. Yeah. Comes back to 70% of times. our thoughts are negative or something like that? I don't know the exact something number. Something like that. But what I do know is that back in prehistoric times, fight or flight was pretty much an hourly event. Yeah. It was either going to punch someone or get eaten by a dinosaur, right? And you were moving from one crisis to another. And, and over time, that negativity bias, which is a, which is a, a part of the brain, is still there and it's, it's responsible for fight, flight, freeze, fornicate. Um, now, the thing about the negativity bias is, is you and I are not in any sort of significant danger right now, yet our default position is to always be on the lookout for danger. And that's a great thing, Ollie, because it stops people doing stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. The flip side of that is, of course, it restricts us from finding solutions and, and back to that sort of responsibility mindset. I think most people that I meet know what responsibility is, but I see evidence everywhere that people don't take it. And what do they need to take it? Well, what they need to accept and understand the fact is that they have a choice in everything they do in life. Mm -hmm. they, they have that choice, and that choice is a gift. And, and, and I, I personally don't like giving gifts away. So if I've got that choice to make that decision, if I'm willing to accept that every decision I make, I make my, for myself, even though it might look like I'm doing it for other people, even if I'm giving to charity, who am I really satisfying? Mm. Myself. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's essentially like tickling your own ego. Absolutely. Yeah. Really. And I'm happy to do that because I, I, I want that chemical release that makes me feel good when I give money to somebody who needs it more than I do. Mm -hmm. But I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for me. You know, back in the training company I used to work, used to, the classic example of, of people would come on the program and we'd go around the introductions, warm-up session before we start the course and tell us a little bit about what you do and I can remember one lady saying yeah you know I'm such and such from such and such place I'm a taxi driver for my kids and you think to yourself actually no you're not you're a taxi driver for your kids for yourself because if you weren't doing it for your reasons which is to make sure that they were safe and they got home on time and that they were tucked up in bed you just give them a 10 pound note and say make your own way home get an Uber yeah we don't do it like that. Uh, and, and that's the point I'm trying to make, is that when, it's, a, it's a deep psychological understanding that when you recognize that you have a choice in every decision you make, why would you ever moan, bitch, or fucking complain about anything you ever do in the future? Because guess what? You don't have to do it. And as difficult as it is to find a new job when you lose one, and I accept that's really tough, especially in this current climate, you still have an opportunity to try and do something about that. Polish up your CV, go and have some conversations with the right people, smarten up your social media, Meet people, talk to people. All of that gift is within your, within your power. But sometimes it's just too easy to sit there and go, I'll wait for someone to do it for me. Exactly, so take responsibility. And like, we haven't really touched on it, obviously, I'm aware of the time, but I suppose setting new goals. As we said about the mindset of goal setting, how, how do you get clients to set their goals? And Yeah, great, great point. So, uh, and again, that sort of comes into this accountability thing. So back to what you and I do for a living which is effectively put content in front of people I always say to my clients at the start look 40% of the work's me 60% is you let's just get that clear at the start before you even decide to spend some money you've got to do some stuff mm -hmm. so I'm going to train your team but when I've left and I've gone home you've got to carry on that training that's got to, again, that's got to be translated into the real world and for that to happen only there has to be accountability and everything that you do with your clients is built on that right, that principle so, so accountability is crucial. When we talk about goal setting, of course, most people want to set goals typically on New Year's Day or New Year's Eve. And then normally around about the fifth or sixth week into the new year, they're back on the 15 pints of Stella and an ice curry. And that's okay, but they fall off. And, and, and setting goals is crucial if you want to achieve, but the reason why people fall off is because they don't plan in advance of what the failure process is. And if I can mitigate the chances of me not staying on my goal path, and I can do that before I start the journey, that does two things. I probably won't make those mistakes or those errors or fall into that trap because I've seen it and I've worked around how it's gonna happen and what I can do about it. 
And the second thing that's going to do is it's going to give me the confidence to know that they won't, they won't, they won't stall me. And you give yourself a much better chance, I think, if you mitigate the chance of it going wrong at the start. And sort of if you think about a model which we, which I always talk about with my clients, which is capability. Let's agree at the start why we're doing it. Let me get sold on the reason why I would want to lose some weight or put on some muscle mass or improve my nutrition. Get sold on myself. Why am I doing it? How am I going to do it? I'm going to engage with Ollie and go through a 12-week program. Okay, what have I got to do? Right, this is where I get my diary out and I put the dates in, the times in. You know, I get really granular on what activity I'm going to be doing on each of those sessions. Then I'm going to ask myself, okay, what's going on around me to, sh to, pr to prove to me that the success is starting to happen? Because part of the hard problem is is seeing the evidence that you're improving. Mm -hmm. And it takes a bit of time, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, especially if you look in the mirror every single day. If you're on the scales every day, you think, well, nothing's happening. Yeah. yeah? And, and, and you need to accept the fact that this is going to take time. But at some point, you will start to see the evidence, whether the scales start to change, whether you can't get in that shirt anymore because your biceps have got a bit bigger, whether you feel fitter or healthier. So you've got to describe what the key performance indicators are in advance. And then the fifth element then is, who else do we need to get involved? Back to that conversation we had half an hour ago, who else is going to help me on this journey? Because I know that at some point I'm going to go off piste and I need someone. If Ollie's not around, I need someone to drag me back in. That's a good one. And, and finally, with, with regards to the books, because your book officially launched today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, this, this podcast is going out um, in a couple of weeks from now, but your first book, Sales Glue, yeah. that was 2016. 2016 that one yeah and now we've got converted what yes. is what is the difference because you're a sales expert the difference between the two books and why now why this book now sales glue was written in 2016 published 2017 and all it really was Ollie, was lead generation i just wanted to make some noise in the marketplace we, we talked about it it's slightly better than a business card mm -hmm. and uh, don't get me wrong really, as you know having written two yeah you know how hard it is to write a book but, but Sales Glue really is, uh, is it, with me putting down a marker that says, okay, I feel confident enough now to get my stuff out there and other people's stuff, which is credited in the book, out in the marketplace. That book really is a, is a self-help book for salespeople. So, so if there's salespeople listening or watching and they think, I'm okay on the sales thing, but I do like the idea of this sort of responsibility and mindset and attitude, 70% of that book is about mindset and attitude. So it's a self-help book for salespeople. Here we are in July 2020. Today is the day, so, so Converted, how to help more people buy what you sell, is a straight, bog standard, no holes barred sales book. And it talks about the 10 steps to go through if you wanna convert a lead into a sale. So, so sometimes you, know, you get a lead through your website or through your marketing, and for whatever reason, you can't get it through to an order or cash, and that hurts, mm -hmm. especially if it's one you wanted. All of those mistakes that you've made are shown in, the, in that book and, and, and the steps of how you make sure you don't make them anymore are covered in the pages. So worth worth a read. Definitely. And out of those 10, not to go through the 10 because people can buy the book for that, what's the most important step? Yeah, there's a step in there called reassure. And reassure really is, um, that's right in the middle of the book. And it comes back to the conversation about return on investment. If I can't reassure you that going ahead is the right thing to do, we're never going to do business together. And that is so much on me as the salesperson than you. Mm -hmm. My job is to reassure you that the decision you're about to make is good for you. And if I can do that, then we're probably going to get to a position where you buy. So I'll, I would say they're all brilliant. <laughs> but that reassure step is probably the one I would encourage people to really focus on. Cool. Well, appreciate you uh, joining me here, on, or me joining you here, and spending the time on the Great, podcast. Great, loved it. And uh, how can people get a copy of your books and get in touch with you if they want to talk about sales? They can go buy the book on Amazon. Yep. Converted Matt Sykes, you'll find the book there. Uh, or if you go to my website, you can also get through the website and the website only is salescadence, all one word, .co.uk. Cool. Well, thank you for taking the time today and uh, hopefully the book gets some real good sales and not just a business card. Thanks, Ollie. Take care.